Week 2 of Seraph has some interesting story moments. The Exo Stranger is back and assists us in our invasion of the Braytech facility on Mars. During the heist, we encounter the submine Charlemagne and afterwards head to the facility on Earth to retrieve the launch codes. This week's story has some great moments. Heartfelt conversations between Elsie and Marisov and some spicy moments between the Brave family and their drama. Mars also appears a little different in one particular area and we'll discuss why. This week, the quest begins with a conversation between Anna and the Exo Stranger, who is back. If you are new, Clovis Bray was their grandfather a long time ago. He turned himself into an AI and, well, here we are now. Elsie the Stranger starts by saying this is a terrible idea. How can we trust Clovis after everything he's done? While this could be true, Anna fires back that Clovis is the only one who knows how to fix the war mind. I haven't verified, but he... But he's the only hope left. As much as you'd like to deny it, Elizabeth, I'm the best you've got. Go to hell. I'm here now. We should talk more, later, without him around. I'm sorry you had to see that. They've always been very emotional. Why don't we get down to business? I have found a solution to our sub-mind problem. Your arrogant friend, Osiris, informed me of the time wounds on Mars. Windows into the past, worlds lost to time. And it so happens that Rasputin's mind lab is situated within such a temporal anomaly. Scans indicate that the Charlemagne submine data still exists within the wound's projected time period. Copying it into the engram will provide code fragments we need to restore Rasputin. Clovis tells us that Mars is fractured with time distortions. Because of this, Charlemagne's data still exists during this time period. This allows us to head back to Mars and extract this information. Now to me, this indicates that something may have happened to Charlemagne in our current time period. You'll see something weird in a moment, and we'll discuss this as well. Back on Mars though, in the Braytech facility, things look as we've seen them except more damaged. This could have been caused by the Pyramid Fleet arrival. Towards the top of the facility, Clovis speaks about power, something he loves all too much. Rasputin's facility was well preserved and that Anna and Elsie should take power before themselves before someone else does. They should be in control. Evil Clovis at work once again. What a fully operational war mind could do in this day and age. In the wrong hands, it would be catastrophic. With proper oversight, our oversight, this place could be the new seat of humanity's power. Rasputin can make his own decisions. He learned to trust when we trusted him. It's not anyone's right to control him. Elizabeth, consider this. A weapon to end every dark future before it begins. Or to usher in a thousand others. My granddaughters, if you don't claim power, someone else will. At the entrance, we find the submine Charlemagne, kill an old foe, and extract the submine we need to help restore the war mind. This is where Charlemagne sleeps. Beautiful, isn't it? It's a step in the right direction. Wait. Wrathborn reinforcements are converging on the future scape. How long do we have? A minute. Maybe less. Not enough to hack the vault, but I can snag some more lasers. Those have significant yield, Anastasia. These instruments are delicate. Any damage... To hell with your precious facility! Guardians, cut your way in! This night attacked the Dreaming City when it harbored Savitin. He is one of Zebu's most trusted. Good! His death will send a poignant message. Alright, now we have some things to go over here. First, the boss in Kelgaroth. Kelgaroth is an ascendant hive loyal to Zivu Arath. I'm planning to make a video on this epic character as I've just read some of the lore and you need to hear it, but here is a quick summary. Kelgaroth once belonged to the Hidden Swarm, a group under Crota on the moon. After Crota's death, most of these hive would turn to Savathun. 
but when she went into hiding, Kelgaroth would pledge his allegiance and loyalty to Zivu Arath, the Hive God of War. From here, he would go on a conquest of many lives and missions, hunting a Tekian in the Ascendant Plane, even ripping out her crystal and wearing it as a trophy, and also meeting with our Guardian numerous times as commanded by Zivu Arath. Zivu Arath is desperate. She's sending her new champion as a last resort. Now, Kelgaroth was sent to Mars to steal the submine Charlemagne, and we can assume it's not the last time we'll see this Hive warrior. Apparently, they were trying to install a Hive soul in the place of the war mine, which would have been pretty scary. Let's talk about this room, though. If you played the War Mind expansion, you may remember this area looked a little different. This was where Rasputin's core was housed, not Charlemagne, so what's going on here? The easiest explanation is the time distortions Clovis said before this mission. This is a different version of Mars than what we experienced a few years ago. The weird part is, I'm not sure exactly why and when this was. Was Charlemagne built here before Rasputin? Did he die and Rasputin was built in his spot instead? Hence why we needed to visit the distortions in a certain time period to find him. Before we explain that decision further with a possible answer, let's take a look at what Charlemagne was supposed to be in Destiny's original story. Originally, there were many different war minds. Rasputin was just one of them, and Charlemagne was the war mind of Mars. There was even a hidden location in the Dust Palace called Charlemagne's Vault, where the thorn was supposed to be found. Here's some concept of that. With Destiny 2, we know this was all changed around and there was only one war mind in Rasputin with possible submines attached to it. In the Destiny 2 narrative preview released in 2018, Tyra Karn, a cryptarch, searches for Charlemagne's vault, which she thinks still exists. She does manage to succeed in finding some fragmented files that give some info. Hellas Basin? The Taurus spot? The same. And while we know there was a Braytag Futurescape there for promotional purposes, Bray even had an AI-led tour, all indications had been that if any research was done there, it was mostly for show, low-level projects creating improved cold-weather gear and the like. But if these records are correct, the facility operated on a far larger scale. It could have been the site of the initial Warmind development, perhaps even a core site for Rasputin itself. This could have been where the Warmind was born. You've got all that from fragmented files? Is this going to be like that time you thought you've identified a second war mind? We spent a decade searching for Charlemagne's vault. I was correct about Charlemagne existing, just not about what it was. If we hadn't done the research, we wouldn't know anything about submines. Also at the bottom of this article in a post titled Rasputin, we see this. I'm accessing available Velusva and Charlemagne resources. I'm assuming control of atmospheric defenses, Warsat Comprehensive, and invoking Aurora Palisade. So, Rasputin took control of Charlemagne's resources and activated a protocol that basically says, defend his core. This could be our answer. Did Rasputin take over Charlemagne's resources and this original area? Back to this week's story. On Earth, we head into the launch facility to try and secure the launch codes. In the end, we are successful, but they are encrypted, so Clovis will need a little bit more time to decode them before use. Security network is operational. I detect no changes to the underlying system architecture. I've secured the launch authorization codes, but it appears they are encrypted. This encryption method is superb. I uh, will need time to fully decrypt them. Any launch will need to wait. Got it. In the meantime, I'll ping some of the old decommissioned bunkers here to cover our tracks, because I just got word that there's a catch inbound. You don't want to still be here when it lands. Not only did Rasputin change the launch codes, but it encrypted the new ones as well. Impressive. One can never be too cautious when keeping secrets. Some information is far too dangerous to remain freely accessible. I've hidden many things from my family, for their own sake. 
I can appreciate Rasputin's decision to do so as well. But that does not change our objective. We must wrest control of the Warsats for the good of humanity. I will begin decrypting the launch codes to the orbital station. Continue gathering submine data and reintegrating it into the Engram. When the time comes, Rasputin will be made to listen to us, regardless of the secrets it keeps. Back in the helm, Anna debriefs us. Clovis is actually helping. She has a hope for this plan, but thinks Clovis could still stab her in the back. First fragments are bonding to Red's code nicely. The plan's risky, but I'll be damned. Clovis wasn't lying. When I first woke up, I wasn't lost. I was wayward in the best way, just my ghost and a name on a badge. I imagined us braze using reason to find right. Lone lights exploring the vast frontier, you know? I was proud of that fantasy. I modeled myself after it. Fantasies, all it was, obviously. I mean, you've met Clovis. He's a walking, talking embodiment of necessary evil. I miss risk being a dark cave in the wilderness. Danger? Or golden age tech? Balancing that tipping point was straightforward. Now it's less defined. And risk is measured in the inches before Clovis's knife finds my back. I know it's coming. Eventually. But if it means getting Red back, I'll manage the risk. And in the terminal entry, we see a conversation between the Exo Stranger and Elsie and Marisov, who have been working together for some time. But she doesn't listen. I try to get through to her, show her the logical consequences of her choices. Then she digs her heels in, and the more I push, the harder she pushes back, even when she knows she's wrong. Siblings, hmm? Oh, sorry. I shouldn't have thrown all that on you. How long have we known each other, Elsie? I... It's hard to really say. With how many times we've been down this road, it feels like forever. But I think... Years. Years. And in all that time, I've only known you as a dedicated sister. Anna's known you for far less. You remember your childhood, the bonds you formed, the trust you built together. She doesn't have that. Anna can't understand the depth of your love or the guilt you carry for your missteps. All she knows is what's in front of her, and that kills you, little by little. You gaze at her and a ghost gazes back, a ghost you desperately want to save. That's the point, isn't it? You have to let people choose for themselves, or you risk driving them down an even darker path than the one you want to steer them from. And we both know how that ends. Don't we? These two have a history, as heard from this dialogue. It'll definitely be interesting to see how this relationship unfolds as the story of this season moves forward. Anyway, Guardians, though, that's all we got for today's lore video. If you'd like to see some others just like this, we recap the story each week. Be sure to subscribe to the channel. Anyway, I thank you very much for watching, and I'll catch you all in the next video.